So I'll, uh, thanks to the organizers for continuing to organize this nice meeting. So I'll be talking about uh, shear flow in glasses. So glasses already, Ranjini has taken the initiative to introduce you to the system. And what we are interested in is the, how these glasses respond when you apply some external shear to these systems. And specifically, we are interested to uh, characterize the uh, kind of dynamical response that we see in these materials when shear is applied. So this is work done in collaboration with Jurgen Horbach, with whom I have been investigating this for quite a long time. And the, uh, all the results that I show are a work done by Gaurav, who was a postdoc in Dusseldorf and has now moved to Berlin. Okay. So uh, uh, why are we interested in this problem? So in a lot of uh, materials, what uh, we observe is that when the, this glass is uh, subjected to some mechanical perturbation, so uh, what you see are these kind of heterogeneous responses that are appearing in the material. So these are metallic glasses, so different uh, metallic glasses. And uh, so these have been deformed, and then the deformation has been stopped. And when you stop the deformation, you see that there are some regions which have deformed more than the others. And these are known as uh, shear bands. And these can be very narrow or very wide, depending upon uh, ambient conditions and so on. So these are metallic systems, and this is a, on the other hand, a colloidal glass, so some, uh, similar to the glass that Ranjini talked about. And here also, one, when one deforms this colloidal glass, you have a region which is flowing more than a region, than some other region. So, uh, so this kind of shear bands or inhomogeneous spatial response is very typical to glassy systems. And in numerical simulations also in model, numerical, uh, uh, model glasses, uh, people have observed this kind of uh, heterogeneous response in uh, uh, mobility or deformation. And this has been observed way back in 2003, 2005, but still we are unable to understand what is the origin of uh, this kind of uh, heterogeneous dynamics. Or uh, if in fact, I would say that uh, we have not even investigated to great details what the transient states through which the system evolves before it goes from the quiescent, quiescent state to the final steady state behavior. So one of the key questions was, are these uh, deformations uh, transient or permanent? Now we believe that these are transient uh, states eventually you get to a completely fluidized state. It depends upon ambient conditions and so on. So what I'll show you today is what are the transient states through which the system goes through before it goes to the steady state. So the system that we are looking at is a standard glass former which has been studied to death. And this is this binary Leonard-Jones mixture. So some uh, standard parameters and so on. So I'll not go into the details. So we take such a system at a super, in a super cool liquid state and then we quench it very quickly to very low temperatures. And uh, then once we reach that temperature, it is followed by aging. So basically we wait for some time before we apply the mechanical uh, shear. So then there are two control parameters, aging and shear rate. So for the first part of the talk, I'll concentrate on a fixed age, which is a large age. And then I'll show you how the response is depending on uh, different shear rates. So we do the deformation like this. So basically you are shearing you're applying a uniform shear rate in this direction, so the box is deforming like this, and we're looking at how the response is subject to this kind of perturbation. So typically, I mean, for a long time, people have been looking at macroscopic response. So the typical macroscopic response is how stress in the system evolves as a function of uh, the, uh, the time or the strain. And what you see here is that initially the system is at rest, so the stress is zero. The shear stress is zero, and then the stress increases, so there is an elastic part. And then at some point, uh, there is a stress overshoot, and th after that, the system yields, okay? And then the stress drops down, and it goes to the steady state when the uh, system starts flowing and so on. Okay, so this is the macroscopic response, and uh, what we'd like to now understand is what are the microscopic states through which the system is going through when, uh, this, uh, when you observe this microscopic response. So one of the things that a numerical simulation uh, can do is to observe the motion of single particles in the system. So that is what we do. So if you observe the motion of single particle in the system, you can compute the mean square displacement of each particle or the, and take the average. And the average mean square displacement as a function of strain, you see that initially there's some ballistic behavior when the particle is still within the neighborhood of the, uh, the cage. And then there is a plateau, it's still localized. And then the cage breaks and eventually you have diffusion, okay? And uh, so we can identify at what time scale this is happening and so on and so forth. So eventually in all cases you have diffusion and then which is the steady state, okay? So what we then, so this is again uh, some average behavior. So what we then try to do is to spatially resolve this mean square displacement or mobility. And this is what you see that at, this is some initial state 
And at a later time, at a later strain, you see that there are regions which are more mobile than other regions, okay? So this is this kind of shear bands that you had seen in experiments. And so this is this mean square displacements and equivalent description is strain. So we'll be sticking to mean square displacement maps. So then what we do is we do a map from this mean square displacements to a sort of a binary map where we say that a particle is active if it has crossed a certain value of this mean square displacement, basically where the case is broken. Okay, and then you get this blue and green regions. So the blue regions are which are active and green regions which are stuck. And then what we look at how this fraction of this uh, blue regions are evolving as a function of time. And what we see is that there's a percolation transition of these active sites, okay? And we see this percolation, percolation transition for all the applied shear rates, independent of all the shear rates. And basically what I'm plotting here is the fraction of active sites and fraction of these active sites which are built part of the spanning cluster. Okay, so this percolation transition is observed for all the uh, imposed shear rates. And this percolation transition happens around this uh, stress overshoot or where the yielding is happening. So, so this kind of, this idea of a percolation transition has been discussed quite a lot in literature, but there was no quantitative uh, investigation of this. And I would say this is one of the first works which has looked at this, okay? And this is the kind of uh, uh, geometry uh, or the, of the act of this mobile cluster, the spanning cluster that you see at the time of percolation, okay? And then what you see is that uh, this kind of after the percolation, so this is the fraction of active sites as a function of uh, applied strain. And you see that initially that for all applied strain rates, the behavior is almost similar, but beyond a certain point, you see that there is a difference in behavior. So the, if you're applying a larger shear rate, the system becomes more uh, mobile. Uh, and if you're applying a slower shear rates, it takes longer and longer time to get fluidized. Okay, uh, I'll skip this for the time being. So then we tried, sorry, then we tried to do some analysis of the, what kind of percolation transition it is happening. So these are different uh, things that we have looked at, finite size behavior. So basically looking at the scaling of the percolation threshold, the clusters, how the distribution of cluster size behaves, how does the P-span uh, grows as a function, as a distance from the critical point. And what we seem to see is that simple site percolation does not describe the behavior. It seems more likely to be a directed percolation process. And you uh, intuitively think that this, is, this could be a scenario because you applied an external drive and there is an anisotropy in the system. Okay, I can, I'd be happy to discuss this further with uh, you uh, later. So the th next thing that we see is, so percolation happens for all applied shear rates, but mm, only for certain uh, uh, shear rates which are small, you see an eventual formation of the shear band. So if your shear rate is too fast, then you're quickly fluidized, but only if your shear rate is small, then you start seeing the formation of these localized structures. So, so for example, this is where percolation is happening. You don't see any kind of localized structures. I mean, this kind of spanning structures you see, but at larger strains, you start seeing this kind of uh, shear bands that are forming in the system, okay? So shear band happens after percolation, and this was an interesting uh, differentiation that we can do to our earlier studies that have happened. And then we can ask how does the shear band grow and so on. So and it's a diffusive process and the diffusion constant of the, how the interface is invading the system. This depends again on the shear rate and this is also something that you'd expect. The slower the shear rate, the more times it takes for the system uh, to get fluidized. So the next thing that we wanted to see is whether we can say what is the degree of uh, uh, heterogeneity that is there in the system. Okay, so you can have diff systems at different temperatures, different ages and so on. And can you quantify that? And then can you give us a bigger picture of how, if the system has some ambient temperature and, amb and, and age, uh, what is the degree of heterogeneity? What is the propensity to shear band? And what is the larger picture that one can? So in order to do that, we look at this spatial profiles of mobility. And from that, we try to quantify the degree of spatial fluctuation that is there, some function, chi. And we see that this function, this quantity chi, or the degree of fl spatial fluctuation, this is uh, non-monotonic with strain. So at early times, you expect that the system is homogeneous, so therefore the chi value should be small. And at light, large times, it is completely fluidized, so the chi value should again be small. Intermediate, this chi value is large, and this is happening where the shear band is actually emerging. Okay? And then we uh, have this uh, kaleidoscope, I would say, of, uh, so it's a uh, map of this chi value as a function of different temperatures. So this is the smallest temperature, this is the largest temperature. We are scanning age and also strain. So just let me explain to you. So if you are at a very low temperature and uh, your age is large, then the heterogeneity is very strong and it also sp it spans over a larger strain window. 
as you decrease your imposed shear rates, this degree, this degree of heterogeneity decreases, and also the window over which the heterogeneity survives is also small. If you go to smaller shear rates, this heterogeneity is no longer visible, at least within this measure. Okay? As you increase temperature, this effect also, the thermal noise also kicks in, and it starts to uh, smoothen out the fluctuations. And therefore, you see that if you go to temperatures which are near the class transition temperature, it's very difficult to see a shear band, even if you go to longer and longer ages. So, okay, so yeah, I'm done. So basically, what we have shown here is that if you are at low temperatures and low shear rates and longer ages, you see uh, there is more propensity to form shear bands. And this is why you also see this in very, uh, very much in metallic classes, because metallic classes are at ambient temperatures, which are room temperatures, whereas uh, the class transition temperature is far, far higher than the room temperature. Okay? So this is more or less what I wanted to tell you. So basically what we have done is we have tried to look at microscopically what is happening to, the, uh, to a class when you are object, uh, subjecting it to imposed shear rate. And what we show is that there is a percolation transition that is happening around the yielding of the class. And subsequently, for small shear rates, the shear bands emerge, and then the system fluidizes. For larger shear rates, you don't see this kind of shear bands. The other thing is also, the, depending upon the age of the system, the response, so this I slightly skipped. So basically, if you look at how the, sorry. So this axis is the age axis. So if you go to uh, larger ages, then there is more of, uh, degree of heterogeneity or more, uh, the shear banding is more prominent. If you add younger samples, this uh, uh, shear banding doesn't happen. Okay, so uh, is the, the percolation happens for all imposed shear rates, all ages. I mean, at least if the age is sufficiently large. And then, but the shear bands only are more prominent at, uh, for more aged samples at smaller shear rates. So this is a distinction that one should make. And yeah, so this is more or less what we uh, have done in this work so far. So we are now trying to extend this to other shear protocols. So Shrikant will talk about oscillatory shear and so on. And we are also interested in micro, uh, micro meso modeling, which would be some multi-scale modeling with Kirsten Martins. So just a side remark, a light remark. So the editors of Journal of Rheology like this picture so much that they made it the cover page. So we are quite happy with this. Thank you. Finished exactly on time. So that's really nice. Uh, we have three minutes for questions, discussions. Yeah. Shiram, yes. Um, so I was just wondering, how far have you carried the analysis of a comparison to direct percolation? Not much, actually. So beyond this exponents, uh, we haven't done much. Yeah, we, I'd be happy to discuss with you. Um, and uh, just short question. The, um, the thing is, when you, when you share something, you're doing something from the boundaries, and the stuff in the interior is sort of getting the forcing right. indirectly. Right. Uh, you know, there's this other thing that Surajit Sengupta has, this, this non-affinity parameter as a way of homogeneously sort of making things mobile. Mm -hmm. Is there a relation between the percolation of these non-affine zones and the, the percolation of... So these mobile? are the non-affine zones, actually, what I'm showing you. So I'm, I, I didn't discuss in details, yes. but... What we are looking at are actually the non-affine displacements, and this is the percolation of this non-affine. So might playing with that field instead of imposing shear be a nicer way of seeing this transition, a more homogeneous way? Yeah, that would be nice. I mean, so, yeah, but that is a more complicated uh, framework to work with. So mm -hmm. we have done the simple thing first. Mm -hmm. We we'll can do that later. So uh, what is the, like, uh, is there any uh, mechanism or microscopic picture of onset of these hotspots? Ah, so that's a million dollar question. So <laughs> if I can answer that, uh, then that would, I'd be very happy. A lot of people would be happy. No, so what we'd like to understand is, is there a structural origin to these hotspots? And so far, uh, there is no conclusive uh, agreement. So different people say it's already encoded in the structure that I'm sharing. But others will tell you that it's actually those hotspots are emerging as you are sharing the system. As it's closing uh, closer towards the yielding uh, point, this, uh, basically these zones are emerging more and more. So it's a combination of basically shear and temperature that could decide where the hotspots would emerge. In fact, they're stochastic in the sense that if you are at thermal, take a thermal system, you can take the same initial state, you can run with different sets of uh, velocities, and you can see that the hotspots emerge at different points, spatial points. So, uh, can they be thought of like uh, rare fluctuations, like ra rare events of? In some sense, you could think of that. Yeah, why not? Okay, I guess. Uh... We have to move on. So uh, thank you again, Pinaki.